Bibles to John chapter 4 once again. We will pick up our reading today in verse 27. Read down through verse 42 if you would. Again, would you please stand as we read God's Word this morning. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, and she went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said unto them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. You may be seated. So I'm going to go back and recount all that we have said in the previous verses before, but we are all quite familiar with this scene in the Scriptures, one of the more famous, I think, scenes, one of the more impactful passages of Scripture in all of God's Word, of how that Jesus has this conversation with the Samaritan woman, and how that his disciples, having gone into the city, did not interfere with this conversation, and how that the conversation went from physical water to spiritual water, and how that it went to the, uh, the revelation, as Jesus said, concerning her morality or lack thereof, we would call, really her immorality, that she had had five husbands, that she lived with a man that was not her husband. Her acknowledgement, oh, you must be a prophet, or the prophet. Jesus said to her as she began to speak to him about where to worship, he said, oh, the hour's coming. It's already coming. It's already on the way here. That neither in this mountain here at Gerizim, in this area where you Samaritans worship, neither in Jerusalem where the Jews worship, is worship going to occur. But worship is going to be in spirit and in truth. So he's looking, as he says here, the Father, my Father, he was speaking of, God the Father, was looking for those who would worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, from genuinely, internally, from inside, from their own spirit, worshiping, truly seeking God from a spirit that has been redeemed, and they have the spirit of God dwelling in them. And then the truth, of course, that they worship Him in the truth, the truth of the Word of God, the truth specifically, really, concerning the Christ, Him. And of course, as we know, we come down later on into that, that Jesus tells her, I who speak to you am He. In other words, I am. It's one of the great I am statements that Jesus makes here in John as He does. The I am, really, he is saying here, is speaking to you. The Messiah is speaking to you. And so we reached the end of that encounter last week, really. And so the disciples come back on the scene. They've gone into the town. And you see here what it says, that they marveled 
First of all, that he was talking with a woman. As we talked about this in the early, in the context of that day, that was not a normal or a usual thing to occur for men to speak to women out in public like that. But not, not only that, but not only was he speaking to a woman, but to a Samaritan woman, they must have been aghast. And you know that there were some of them that wanted to perhaps interrupt the conversation to say something to Jesus. In fact, in all honesty, if I've looked at other, uh, other parts of, of the Gospels, I'm surprised Peter didn't say something. But he didn't. He held his tongue in this. So they didn't say, what are you seeking? To the woman, I think that's what this is really the question there. They're asking the Samaritan woman, what are you seeking? Or, you know, to Jesus, why are you talking with her? Why are you having this conversation? Don't you know that this is not the, the social norm? But you see, Jesus is teaching us some lessons here about, I think, who we can talk to about Christ and salvation. I think we have the tendency sometimes, mistakenly, to say, well, this person in this condition is not, for lack of a better term, savable, redeemable. There may have been many in that day that the disciples said, Jesus is like when the little children came to him and they said, oh, go away, go away. And Jesus forbid them not for such the Father redeems. You must become as little children to come to Christ. So they don't ask the questions. They don't interrupt. And, and as I thought about this scenario, another lesson, if you look here in the Scriptures, in the life of Jesus, really the most profound spiritual lessons that we see in the Scripture are Jesus' one-on-one -on -one encounters with sinners. Are they not? Nicodemus, you must be born again. This lady right here, I who speak to you am he. Think about others. Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Nobody have anything to do with Zacchaeus. Oh, he's He's horrid. He's a sinner. He's a tax collector. We hate him. Jesus looked at him up in that tree. He says, hey, boy, come on down. I'm coming to your house. He was criticized for that. The gathering demoniac that everyone was afraid of, that the chains would not hold. Jesus went into the tombs where he was and when they found Jesus later on in this demoniac, guess what? He was in his right mind. Well, surely he was in his right mind. He had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, who was God over the mind. We see also in another passage, the woman called, caught in adultery, and all of her accusers left. And Jesus was left alone with this woman. He said, go and sin no more. You see, Jesus is gives us, I think, much good, a very good example, and also we see his compassion for sinners. And over and over again, that Jesus was not concerned by what other people thought. It came, as he said, to seek and to save that which were lost. And this is really, when we talk about, we want to talk about biblical evangelism, what biblical evangelism is, let me say this, so I think it's gotten lost in this day, is this idea that biblical evangelism means having a big revival. We don't, sometimes we, we don't use those terms so much anymore as we used to, but you have a big revival, and you get all these people to come, and you preach the gospel to them, and you get them converted, and you have them repeat a prayer, and then you just turn them loose, okay, okay. Best to you. No. I believe that biblical evangelism is one redeemed sinner talking to an unredeemed sinner. One beggar who has found bread talking to somebody that's looking for bread. Somebody that has the water of life and knows what it is to say, hey, 
to the one who's thirsty and who's devoid of life and having that water of life. Hey, I know where you can get something that will satisfy your soul. That's what Jesus was saying here to this Samaritan woman. So we move on from there. So what it says there is the woman left her water jar and she went away into town and said to the people. Now there's all sorts of things that are said here about what does this mean that she left her water jar. Some say that she just left it there so that Jesus and the disciples could have something to drink. But I don't really buy into that idea. I believe that she left it behind because she forgot all about the physical water. She forgot all about that, which she was trying to satisfy her soul with. And that was really the issue, this soul dissatisfaction. She had gone to the well for water to meet her physical need, but when she went back to town, she left it. She forgot about it. I don't think this was an accident. Well, I know it wasn't an accident. We don't believe in accidents. We don't believe in luck. We don't believe in any of the... We believe in God's providence. I believe that this is here for a reason. She left her water pot. She left behind what she had been seeking and thirsting for. Because why? Because she had met the Christ. The Christ. The Messiah. The Savior of the world. I thought about... Philippians chapter 3, great chapter there. Uh, Paul giving an account of what he had given up for the name of Christ and because of his salvation. You go down to verses 13 and 14. He said, Here, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm forgetting what I've given up. All those aspirations, all those dreams, they mean nothing to me. I believe the Samaritan woman says, what water pot? <laughs> I'm leaving it behind. Something else, I've, something else has happened, and, and I, I don't really, I'm not even thirsty anymore. And this is what happens, I think, when salvation occurs, when, that what we once pursued, we no longer pursue or desire over Jesus Christ. I believe that Christianity is something that is to be radical. The, the social Christianity that we see in so much of, of our country, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, people talk about, well, we live in the Bible Belt. Now, there's some advantages to that because there are people that have respect for obedience and law and those kind of things, and, and we can respect some of that. But in some ways, it's, it's also a curse because everybody that, that's born and raised in East Texas sometimes thinks they're a Christian. They have this social Christianity. But there's no change in their life regarding their appetites, their thirst, their desires. I read that passage before I remember when he talked about forgetting what was behind and straining forward for what's ahead. I remember a, a pastor that I knew many years ago. He says, he titled his sermon, Don't Look Back, Look Ahead. And above all, look up. You see, that's what we do. We're not to live in the present. We're not to live just for this present world. It's fading away. It's, I don't want to say a whole lot about the tree huggers, but let me tell you something. This world is going away. It's not going to be forever. God didn't create it to... to, to be forever. And I don't think we ought, you know, I don't go out and, and just throw trash everywhere and, 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 and desecrate the, the beautiful creation of God. I don't do that. But we, we're not to live for this world. 
And certainly when we have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation, we are to forget what is behind and we are to press forward toward the mark. Pressing, we are pressing toward heaven. I think about a passage that we'll get to sometime down the road in John 6 where so many of those that followed Christ after he multiplied the loaves and the fishes and he fed the 5,000 and then when he began to teach the truth, they, they all turned around and went away. You look in verse 66 of John 6, it says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus turns to the twelve. You guys want to go too? Do you want to go away? And Simon Peter, in one of his great statement says this Lord to whom shall we go you have you have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God if you have truly had an encounter with the, the Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ of heaven how can you turn and go back the other direction Uh, my thought is that you can't really. Nothing, nothing in this world will satisfy like Christ does. And that's what the believer's first is for, is for Christ, for him. So it went, says here that the Samaritan woman uh, went away and she, she left her water jar and she went back into the town and she said to the people, now some versions say to the men, but... The, the, in the Greek, people is a better translation because it means generic. She went back into the town to the others. She starts telling people of her encounter here with Christ. And she says, hey, come, see a man. She, she just says, see the man. See this man. I, I want you to come and look and come to his presence. But, but she says, this man, that she said he... he Told me all that I ever did, and can this be the Christ? Well, I think that she was, in a way, her own winsome way, in using her 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 wits about her as, as best she could to to have. Hey, this this man told me all that I ever did. This is no ordinary one. She knew he was not. She said he told me all these things. The only way that anybody could ever do that was because he was omniscient. Because he knew my past. He knew my present. He knew what I was. Could this be the Christ, the Messiah, for whom we have been waiting? I mean, the Samaritans were looking for the prophet to come. Could this not be him? Could this not be the Messiah that we've been looking for? Who else but the Messiah could have such knowledge of, of what my past was like, what my presence was like? I'd never met him, but he knew all of that. He knew my sin. He knew my need. He spoke to me. He revealed himself to me. I mean, he already said, I am. In verse, back in verse 26. See, when, again, the illustration here is when Jesus comes, when Jesus is, is, seeks out a sinner, as we see in the Scriptures, you know, he goes to the sin issue. He goes to the spiritual issue. Nicodemus said, oh, you're a great teacher. Hey, Nicodemus, you must be born again. This lady came for water. He says, I am. I'm the living water. So this is what Jesus does. Does he not? Does he not find us in our sinfulness? He reveals our need of forgiveness for sin. He saves us. He does not leave us in our sin. Aren't you glad that we have a merciful and gracious and loving Savior? He doesn't just say, hey, you're a sinner. Okay, do the best you can. Maybe you'll make it to heaven. <laughs> no. You is he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then, but God who is rich in grace and mercy for his great love with which he loved us. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. He didn't just leave us in that sin. Praise God he saves us. He brings, brings us out of that. And I'm looking at something else here, just a thought that I had here. 
she doesn't try to, you know, I see in this a very, as I said, winsome, very gentle way. Hey, come, listen to this man. Come and hear this man. Come and see this man. Let me, let me say this. What I have seen so much of in personal evangelism is that people trying to cram Jesus down somebody's throat. You want me to tell you something? You can't do it. It takes the working of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and a believer who is ready and willing and able to share the gospel with somebody. That's what it takes in this. As I said before, it's a redeemed sinner telling a lost sinner about Jesus. It is, it is this one-on-one -on -one interaction like Jesus had with her he, that, that we are to exercise in relationship to our personal uh, uh, interactions with others. I mean, have you ever had that happen and, and, and where you just come into a conversation with somebody and it just opens up and it's basically like Jesus saying, hey, here they are. You know, tell them about me. Tell them the gospel. And let me tell you something. You don't have to look very far in this world for broken people. And there's a lot of broken people in this world. Maybe there's a lot of them that see what's going on in this world at this present time. And how many millions in the world have died from COVID or Corona, but other than that, people die all the time. But during times like this, that people are a little bit more open to talk about the Lord and talk about eternity and talk about those things. We can share, hey, if all you're living for is this world, let me tell you something. It's not going to last forever, but there is a hope. And that hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. What are we told here in verse 30? They went out of the town and were coming to him. They left the town. They listened to this lady. That's really a miracle in itself. If what we really believe to be true about her is, is true, that she was a woman of not great reputation, of the five husbands, and the one man living with her, that was not her husband, but something about what she said, God used that, I believe. God used through the Holy Spirit. He used that to say, hey, we're going to go out here and see what she's talking about and see this person that she's talking about. The Spirit of God was at work here. And let me say this. In salvation, the Spirit of God drawing and working is absolutely essential. Essential. It's not about methodology. It is about Praying, God, these that I talk to, may your Holy Spirit work. May your Holy Spirit draw. May your Holy Spirit enliven in this. Again, in the next chapter, and in, in John 6, in verse 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Verse 44, there. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up on the last day. And then you go down to verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I speak, I have spoken to you, are spirit and life. Yes, we should be ready. We need to be equipped with the Word of God and the Gospel to give an answer to every man who asks concerning the hope that is in us. But also we need to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential to salvation. Nobody gets saved without the Holy Spirit. Nobody. It is the Spirit that quickens and gives life. And you notice something here? Jesus doesn't go anywhere. He didn't get up and leave the well. You know why? I got some folks coming. There's, there's some lost sheep out there here in this city of Sychar. These Samaritans, I'm waiting for them. They're coming. Made me think about, you know, those passages about the shepherd who left the 99 sheep and went out to find the lost one. Jesus is waiting for these lost sheep here. But they, in, this, in this analogy, they're coming to him. 
But his desire and his delight was to see sinners come to repentance. He delights in repentance. He delights in salvation, in the saving of souls. And so, we have an interjection here. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him. You wonder, here's the disciples are here. And they're saying, Rabbi, eat. You know, the disciples are concerned for Jesus, for his physical well-being. They urge him to eat something. Don't you need something to eat, Jesus? I mean, you were wearied from the journey. And you know what? We don't ever have an account here that Jesus ever got anything to drink either. And maybe he did. We don't know. He said, Jesus, don't you want something to eat? They were still preoccupied with the physical need. But Jesus' mind and soul was set on something else. These lost sheep that were coming to him, here to be found. And it wasn't, you see here, this is not just about one lost sinner. This is about a town and many lost sinners, as we see here. And I'm sure that his statement here to them in verse 32 is very strange. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? When he says this, I have found food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples said to him, has anyone brought him something to eat in this place? They're all perplexed. Their minds were still upon the physical. On what is going on here? And let's bless our hearts. I mean, it says that, you know, there were times when Jesus reproved his own 12 disciples for their spiritual dullness. And they're still a little dull here concerning these statements of Jesus. But now let's, let's be fair. We have the perspective of looking back into the gospel accounts and those kind of things. And there's still times, beloved, when we are dull spiritually. When it takes us some time, sometimes we're for us to get the things, the great truths of God's Word. But Jesus does explain to them what He means. He does not rebuke their dullness, their dull thinking here. What He says here is, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me to accomplish His work. My food... My desire, what feeds, what satisfies my innermost being, is to do the Father's will. To finish the, the work that the Father sent him to do. The Father sent the Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, his only beloved Son, with on a mission to accomplish, to finish this work. Throughout the Gospel of John, over and over and over again, we see this phrase here. The will of him who sent me. In fact, I counted it, or I tried to count it, at least 29 times in the Gospel of John was this phrase used, that Jesus used. He wanted everyone to be sure that this is not just my will. This is not on my mission. This is the Father's mission. This is what the Father has sent me to do. You look at this look in chapter 5. Verse 30. What Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Back again in chapter 6, this time in verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Chapter 8, verse 18. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Chapter 12, verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And last of all, of course, John 17. And there... 
In those first three verses, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him the authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So he said here, my food, that which satisfies my innermost being, that is my utmost desire, is first of all to do the will of him who sent me. Again, believer, here's an example for us. In Christ's example is seen a principle that the aim of, and the goal of our Christian lives is to do the Father's will, to please Him, to not pursue the food of this world. If you have any doubts about that, go this afternoon and read the book of 1 John. And see there how that talks about that, that those that love the Father are going to be obedient to Him. They're going to do His commandments. They're going to walk in light and not in darkness. And that, that, that is for us to do. We are to submit ourselves to the will of God the Father. What are most people following after? In this day, you know, Elijah was talking about addictions this morning. The world has a world addiction. They're addicted to food, to drink, to money, to pleasure, to entertainment. That's the world's food, that's what the world desires. Our food and our desires to please Him. It always amazes me when I. Of course, you know I work in a secular job. When I go back to work, I hear about, you know, did you have a good weekend? People talking about, oh, yeah, I cooked this on the grill. I had some brisket. I had some hamburgers. I went out on my boat out on the lake. I went to the movies. I did all these kind of things, you know. Nothing about the Lord's Day. Nothing about going and being in God's house. Uh, pursuing him, but there's all these other things. Why do they, why are they doing that? Because their food is to pursue that. That is the food that they desire. The unregenerate, the lost. There ought to be seen a different desire in the lives of God's people. That our food is like Jesus Christ's food to do the Father's will. To pursue those things, not that are behind, but that are ahead of us and before us. Doesn't mean that we can't go home and cook on the grill and have a good burger. We have to have food. But that, there's nothing wrong with riding out on the lake in a boat or fishing off the back of a boat or whatever you want to do. But is that what you're pursuing? Is that your main desire of your life? As a believer, changed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God, our desire is to be for something else that the world can see. It's not to be something hidden away that, ooh, I'm going to be a secret Christian. No, it's to be evident in our speech, in our actions, our pursuits in life. Jesus had already taught over Matthew the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, in Philippians chapter 3, this time a little farther up in that passage, in verses 7 through 9, what was it that Paul talked about? He said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Salvation removes us 
from a life of selfishly serving self to serving Christ. And then others, what are the two great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. That's the calling of our life that we're to be obedient to as believers. To love Him first and love others that comes out of that. But also he says here that his food is to accomplish his work. He says, I'm doing my Father's will. I'm pursuing my Father's will, but there's a work that I've got to do to accomplish that work. Christ came to do a work. You look in John, in John 5 and verse 17. He says it over here. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Verse 36 of this same uh, chapter here says, But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me, that the Father has sent me. There was a work that He came to do. Gave witness to the Father. Well, ultimately, what was the ultimate work for which he came to do? The hour for which he was born. It was the work of accomplishing salvation. The broken body and the shed blood. That's what he came to do. That was the work that he came to do. To do what was required by the Father. In order to accomplish, in order that we might be saved. No broken body, no shed blood, guess what? No salvation. He said, this is the work that I came to do in this. He was born to finish the work of securing the salvation of everyone who would ever believe. This was the work of the Savior. Isaiah 43 and 11 that, that tells of, of, of Christ, I, I am the Lord and besides me there is no Savior. There's no Savior besides Him. There's no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. If you're looking to something else, to someone else, you're wasting your time. Islam can't save. Buddha can't save. Hinduism can't save. New Age, whatever they call it, works, seeking, can't save. It won't save. Jesus recognized the work that I came to do that must be accomplished is this work for this hour I was born. Think about it in Matthew 1, verse 21. What was told to Mary there? Well, I'm sorry, excuse me, not Mary, but to Joseph. And her husband Joseph, if you look there in verse 19, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is, born, which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That was the work he had to accomplish. The work of saving his people from their sins through his sacrifice upon the cross, a cruel cross. There. What was it when Jesus was hanging upon the cross there at the very last as he had been beaten, as the crown of thorns had been placed upon his head? If you look further on in John 19 and 30, you'll find the words, what Jesus said. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. What the word there means in the Greek? Accomplished. An end has been made. The work that Christ was sent by the Father to do was accomplished. The blood was shed. The blood that reconciles us to a holy God, He had poured out. 
He performed the Father's will perfectly while he was here on earth. And he accomplished the work completely that the Father had sent him here for. And that's what he said to the apostles. This is my food. This is the desire of my innermost being is to do this. What a great example for us to understand. Now, I, I, don't, I can't buy anybody's salvation, but I can do the Father's will. I can submit myself to the Father, and I can submit myself to He who died upon the cross for my sins. And I can pursue Him in my life and make my life the food of my life to pursue Him and to be and to, and to pursue Him in all that I do every single day. Hear His voice. Listen to what He has to say here. See what He has called us to do as believers is to do His will. To pursue after Him. To pursue to be like Christ. That's what we've been called to. Not to satisfy self any longer. Say, well, I just want a little bit of Christianity. I still want a little bit of the world, but and a little Christianity just to be sure I'm going to heaven. No, that's not what we've been called to. We've been called to be conformed, saved to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be holy as He is holy. Is what we're to strive after. Well, I didn't get as far as I wanted to today. But next week we'll get back here to Jesus' conversation with the disciples. And I do pray that the Lord's Word has spoken to you today. The Holy Spirit has given us much to think about in regards to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course, this is our Lord's Supper Sunday. For those of you that have not been here before, in regards to this, what we do is at the end.